Welcome to Business Talk Sister Gawk. I'm Ruthie. And I'm Becca. <laughs> and today we're joined with Stacy or by Stacy from Kids to Market. Uh, thanks so much for being with us today, Stacy. Tell us a little bit about uh, what you do. Um, well, Kids to Market is an entrepreneurship program for kids and teens. And essentially, I have taken what I've done in a classroom environment for the past four years with hundreds of kids and I've moved it online. So I teach them how to start their own business, usually a small business or a micro business, but there's been some that have kind of skyrocketed and taken off. But I take all the, the B school out of it and make it really simple and really consumable and fast so that they can get their product idea out there and start selling it. So that's sort of the, the gist of it. Yeah. Okay. Um, so you're joining us today from Canada, since we're all kind of in quarantine. Becca is joining us on uh, our Zoom call on the phone. Um, so her audio is going to be a little bit different and she might have a little bit of lag, um, just so everybody's aware. But uh, tell us why you started doing what you do now. So you kind of talked about how um, you were doing it in a classroom, like what caused you to start what you're doing? Okay, um, well, a little bit of background. Uh, I've been an entrepreneur for over 20 years and I was in IT. So I started out actually as an employee, as a consultant. I was a computer programmer. And when the dot com rush came, so that's sort of aging me. <laughs> so I was like, when all that crazy kind of happened, I ended up as the senior producer of a, a travel startup, like Travelocity or Expedia or that kind of thing. They were actually our competitors. And through that process, I learned what it looks like to start a business from scratch. I had to sit in on venture capitalist meeting for funding. We were a small, tight knit group. I had to learn things on the fly because because we're such a small team, you know, all of a sudden somebody needs to know how to do banner advertising online. So we would learn that as quickly as we could so that we could go ahead and do it. Or all of a sudden we were having huge shopping cart abandonments or there wasn't a completion of the shopping cart. So that was the thing that I took on. And I went um, and got uh, another degree because I have a few. I decided to go to the local university where they actually had a human computer interaction lab there and talked to the prof there and said, I want to audit a master's degree so that I can apply it to the dot-com startup that I'm working for around usability. And he thought that was a brilliant idea. So the foundation to becoming an entrepreneur was sitting inside of a startup. So it wasn't my business originally, but we all took ownership in, we all had shares and stocks in the company. We had an, a vested interest in seeing it succeed and watching everybody learn real time in order to be success, successful and the speed with which that had to occur, you know, business plans are written on napkins and I, you know, I don't care if I get the, <laughs> the master's degree, I'll just go and take and cherry pick the courses that I need to accomplish the task. And all of a sudden I was doing user studies and, you know, having to bring people in and compensate them and having to deal with um, tester ethics, right? So when you bring somebody in, you have to test a user on something. How do you do it ethically and make sure that there's privacy and then that, that mushroomed from there. The learning curve was so steep mm -hmm. that I learned more, regardless of the master's program that I took, I learned more being part of that startup in probably eight or nine years of university you know, in the other other work that I did, I mean, I worked for Deloitte, so I wasn't with small consulting companies. You know, I was with um, Arthur Anderson. Again, I'm dating myself because I think that's Accenture now. So I worked with a lot of different <laughs> companies and a lot of big software companies, but working with a, a startup, working in an entrepreneurial venture, it just changes the way you learn. Okay, so we'll fast forward from there. I had kids, I got married. And we decided that uh, when my first finished kindergarten, uh, we decided to homeschool. And the reason why was because my kindergartner threw himself on the ground in the parking lot and said, there's no way I'm going back to school full time in the fall. So he just thought that was a, a horrible idea. And he went to an excellent school, art inspired, you know, Waldorf Montessori trained people. <laughs> there couldn't be anything more lovely about the school that he was in, but being away from us all day long, really seemed to stress them out. And we both worked from home. So by this point, I'm an independent contractor and I have started my own business 
bringing teams together to do usability for other companies because dot-com crashed mm. and our company died and they got bought out, you know, like that whole evolution happened. So now I'm homeschooling my kids and I've been doing it for over 10 years. And the homeschool program that I was part of said, can you do a, a co-op? Can you teach a class? So I taught analog clothing and I taught dance because I used to be a dancer and I had been approached by a few parents on a different subject saying, I, I don't know if my child's going to be successful. So I was coaching a lot of homeschoolers on, I'm worried that I'm ruining their life. A lot of homeschoolers go through this sort of trust issue and it sounded like starting a business to me. It sounds exactly the same when we decide that we're going to do this as sort of this trust and this leap of faith, and we don't know that we're going to be successful and there's going to be lots of failures along the way. And it dawned on me through all of these conversations and coaching that what these parents really wanted was something that would show them tangible evidence that their child was building the skills they needed to be successful. And that's just when it clicked. I was like, well, why don't we teach them how to start their own business? Because there is no better learning opportunity than that. And I didn't think they would <laughs> want to do it. Right. So, you know, it's like there went, yeah, but they're as young as six. And I didn't know if it would work. I'm like, ah, it's no problem. It's no problem. Yeah. A six year old can totally do this, you know, and, and, and I actually had the younger ones first. I didn't even have teens in the program to begin with. And it could have been a hot mess for all I know. I had no idea that she was going to be successful. I was sort of a shot in the dark. You know, I have a captive audience. Their parents pay to be there. You know, I didn't have a business <laughs> plan to teach them. I, you know, like I was like, okay, so how do I, how do I make this consumable so that kids can take it in? And so I would throw things at them literally the first year and go, well, let's try to do it this way. And then they, you get some things, they would kind of go catatonic. They actually look like they were in real school. They would <laughs> daydream, <laughs> they would go off. So I started changing how I taught it and the information I brought forward to those things that really the end result was, you're going to come up with your very own product idea or service, and you're gonna sell it for money. So I started to switch the program. I started the very first class with, who here would like to make some money? Okay, now I have their attention, right? And the teens later on, by the way, are the ones that have the most difficult time with this. What do you mean I can make my own money? You, you, like I, I don't know, you're gonna make your own money. We're gonna start your own business. Okay, hold on a second, how much money can I make? Well, I don't know how much money you can make. That's entirely up to you. And then we continue to argue, okay, what's the upper limit? What's the upper limit that I can make? There is no upper limit. Sky's the limit. You can make as much as you think you can make. It depends on how hard you want to work at this. Yeah. And then they're in. It's like um, uh, Benjamin Zander. Have you ever guys heard that pianist? He talks in a TED talk about how the kids will plunk away and he shows you at what age and stage. And then you can tell that they've moved past that difficult, uncomfortable. They've persevered through learning to play piano where they're leaning in and sitting on one butt cheek. They're like one butt cheek playing now, you know, they kind of lean in, <laughs> right? And so you've got these kids who, and not one of them didn't do it. I didn't have anybody who didn't, this isn't a project, would you like to be in a science fair? We're gonna go through the projects and then 10% of them actually go ahead and submit their project and their logged hours and get to be part of the science fair. Every single one of them, every single year, comes up with a business idea and takes it to market and sells it. Now I make it easy for a lot of them in those bum and seat class because I create a children's business fair. Mm. And what's interesting about those markets is that I get kids who weren't part of the class wanting to come and be part of the market. So it's very attractive. Lots of kids come in and do it, but all of them come up with a business idea. So the model that I created with coming up with a business idea just really brings home the idea that this comes from your own passion, mm -hmm. your own interests. And from there you provide value. And maybe that value is, is you're solving a problem for somebody else, or maybe you're just bringing a little bit of joy. Cause I don't know about you, but cupcakes definitely bring me joy. <laughs> so if they're making cupcakes, you know, you can't say, well, you're not curing cancer, but you are bringing joy. I, I hate baking. So I am a big fan of bake sales and bakeries and my cookies look like cow pies, you know, it just, I'm not that good at it. <laughs> so I'm an IT professional, you know, despite being a stay at home mom and a homeschooler, 
you know, those crafty things I'm not that good at. So I embrace the idea of outsourcing those things. And when you explain that to these kids, six to 17, that their own ideas and their own passions are valued, they're valuable. You bring value. And at the end of it all, they stand a little taller, they smile a little wider. I hear things like, I didn't know that my stuff would sell. I wish I would have made more. I could have made more money. I had so much fun doing this because I'm shy and I wasn't really willing to talk to people. But when I get to talk about my product because I'm so proud of it, it's easy for me to talk to other people. So from a schooling standpoint, you're hearing, you know, those oral communication and presentation skills are constantly trying to work into the curriculum. Mm -hmm. You're hearing perseverance. Um, some were saying, man, I tried six different businesses and I had to change businesses and it finally worked in business. We call that a pivot. That's resilience. Mm -hmm. Instead of I'm a failure, it's I've failed and I can get up and try again because I will experience success eventually. And as soon as they experience that success, their whole outlook on who they are, they're flexible thinking, they're critical thinkers now, they're problem solvers. And it doesn't matter what you put in front of you. You know, a dot-com startup, I went and audited, I asked, can I audit a master's degree? <laughs> and I, there's, you know, that class over there, that one's too schooly. I don't want to take that. I don't need to learn C, you know, C programming. I already know how to do that. I don't have to prove to you that I've done it. I want usability inspection methods. Can I take that? So when you go through the cycle of starting a business, the learning, what happens in their brain is so phenomenal, but more importantly, it's emotionally what happens to them. It's that can do attitude. I can do anything. I can learn anything. And I think it proves that. So that's, I took all of that and I'm moving it online. So that was a really long explanation to your question. But that's kind of <laughs> so that's it. I've got this whole business online now, so I can reach more kids. That's really the the objective. So you had so, um, like, sorry, Becca, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, there's a little lag here. So um, were there any uh, barriers to entry when you started doing this, or what what did that look like to um, move everything, or even start what you were doing? To begin with, how was it hard in that aspect? No, it wasn't because I had a captive audience. Like I said, no, I have to admit it wasn't hard. I, I know it's like barriers for entry for me. You can probably tell by now my personality is very gregarious and I'm an ask for forgiveness person. So I just go ahead and do it. And then if it wasn't the right thing, I apologize and move on and do something else. Right. So it's in, it's in my own personal nature to do that, you know, but I think that that's actually the benefit of the class is that you get my attitude attached to the teaching. It's the, Oh, you totally, you, you can do this. You can rock this. You got this. Like it's no problem. Right. It's just, yet yeah, it's the perspective or the attitude. So I had a captive group because of the homeschool program I was in. They came to me and said, can you teach a class? And I was allowed to do whatever I wanted. <laughs> so I had a, I had a green field. Yeah. I could do whatever I wanted. So no, I didn't have any barriers online a little bit more. Yes. Yeah. Tell us about that. So you, from what I'm understanding, you originally, the, the, uh, the parents approached you and then you had the kids as captive audience and the parents were also there too. Or not really? Yeah. So in the, no, they don't come into the class. Oh, okay. You know, so you really like, <laughs> co right? Because we're with our kids 24 seven. Yeah. We look for opportunities to have 30 minutes to ourselves. <laughs> so you know, there's, a, there's a lot of uh, drop and run for the coffee shop that goes okay. on. So, yeah, I mean, that's the reason why I was asked if I could do the co-op is because I can handle the classroom management. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So it's, and they knew that already because I had taught some other classes like, you know, teaching kids analog coding or um, teaching, right. you know, kid, like little kids dance. If you don't have them captivated with a whisper, they're going to be running out in the hallway for snack in seconds. Right. Yeah. So it's kind of the way that it is. But the, um, the, I think the transition into online has been a challenge because mm -hmm. I'm not surrounded by a community of people that then, word of mouth because it's new I mean maybe it will happen otherwise but um and I can't say that it's been difficult because I really I launched this like the end of February it's <laughs> that's brand new it's it's totally new and I have a whole bunch of students already so they're in there some of the feedback I'm getting though interestingly is that 
I have this um, self-paced course that they can go through. And I get a lot of people emailing me saying, I just would rather have a live class. So they're, they're, there's not as much enthusiasm for here's a handed out curriculum and I do it all in video. So it's like me teaching the class, but a lot of people, and maybe it's because of COVID-19, maybe it's because of the situation we're in right now is people are starved for interaction, right? Like they just, Mm -hmm. They need a live person. They want to talk. And so I, I can't really tell if this is going to fly yet. <laughs> I can't quite figure it out. So what is your website called for that? And can anybody join or? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I mean, it's meant for under 18, but I'm not going to stop you as an adult from buying the class. <laughs> I get a lot of moms saying, geez, I wish you would do this for us. So I do get, and I'm like, well, there, there are better schools than me for that. I mean, you probably need a lot more detail. Um, and so I send them good suggestions because I myself have done a lot of those classes. So those online programs, but it's kids to market. Um, so it's the number two instead of TO kids to market.com. So that's, and if they go on, they get a pop-up right away saying, try the first module for free, which is the idea generation. Hmm. Cause the biggest question I get is how do I start? Like I want to start a business, but I don't even know, like, I don't know how to come up with a business idea. And so that's the genuine gift of this course is that over five years of testing this on as young as six, the method that I use to come up with an idea works for everyone. And when they see it happen and they go through the exercise, there's a lot of aha moments. So if I do live classes, I guess some kids are kind of meh, <laughs> you know, my mom made me come and stand here and listen to this. <laughs> so by the end of the class, you know, you know, where I walk them through the process of coming up with their own business idea. They're not even, I'm talking to mom by the end because they've, they've run off off the screen to go and, you know, do it themselves. And so I'm sitting there by myself going, okay, well, I guess, I guess we're done. Off you go. <laughs> so that's free. I mean, that's free online right now. So they can, I opened it up for free um, just so that people can try it and see what the videos are like and see who I'm about. So a parent can definitely sign up and just watch it before even it's, and it's open forever. You can, once you buy that course, you have access to that course, that, that module forever. So they can give it a try. Yeah. Um, so I wasn't sure if I was going to ask the next question, but <laughs> <laughs> so uh, one thing that I was just kind of curious about, I always like to ask things that I think maybe other people would wonder too, um, is what, so since you're in Canada, what uh, does entrepreneurship look like there? Is there any other differences like that you know of, of it's pretty much all the same as all? It's identical. Oh, yeah. I, I think, okay. and it's, and it's in the prices are in us dollars okay. and you won't know that when I'm doing the costing, when I put a dollar sign that I'm not, you know, if you're in the UK or you're in Australia, well, Australia use a dollar sign as well. <laughs> so, you know, like it, it translates to anywhere that would have that. I don't actually put USD or Canadian after the class we're setting the price or how do you determine the base cost for your product is not specific. But if you were in the UK or you were in Italy, then yes, I'm speaking about dollars and cents. I'm not talking about pounds and pence. So, okay. you know, it's, it's sort of obvious that I'm, somewhere my accent would say I've got to be somewhere in North America so <laughs> yeah because yeah. when I was talking with so, a, a friend of mine who's from uh, Taiwan and because Becca and I were helping a friend of ours in their adoption process and we were selling jellies and we were going door to door and selling um, these like jams and jellies and stuff and brilliant. Um, yeah, and then the one of my friends was helping us. This one, this girl from Taiwan, and she was like, "This would never fly. Like, we yeah, would never do this." <laughs> like, so I just was curious if entrepreneurship looks different. And but yeah, okay. Yeah, it doesn't. I think mostly, if you're in North America, I'm not sure that it would work in Mexico. Mm -hmm. It might because Mexico. It might actually. It would actually work in Mexico. I've been to Mexico a lot. And they would have a lot more freedoms about children setting up their own market cart, right? Like there's a lot more freedom when it comes to curbside selling. I mean, we've got a lot of laws. Our laws are no different than yours. And it does change from city to city, from province to province, from state to state. I mean, there's a whole pile of states where lemonade stands are illegal. We can't have them here either without actually having a business permit that costs over a hundred dollars. Wow. Right. So there's, I mean, everywhere, and the course addresses legal issues in a, in a sort of final 
in a final uh, a module where I say you, you need to do some research. Is it that you can run your own little market stand? And I say like, you know, you have to think lemonade stand, but it's your own product, as long as you're on private property. And usually that's okay, right? And then there's issues around food. If you're gonna sell food, um, you can, we have what's called bake sale, sale rules in my province. So it's usually typically for a charity, but as long as it doesn't have raw milk, in it or raw eggs you know like royal icing or cream puffs or stuff like that as long as it's baked first um, then you can go ahead and sell it without actually having a commercial using a commercial kitchen and uh, having that food license uh, you know so there's tons of rules and restrictions mm -hmm. around it and I address that and everyone's gonna have to do the research in their own town their own county you know what it is that needs to be done and I make that really clear and I provide a few links North American wide. So as an example, you know, like Maricopa County in Phoenix or, you know, Ellensburg in Washington. And so I've done some random research around the United States and across Canada um, and in the UK and in Australia, because obviously those are, are probably more targeted people. I don't know if this would work in Hungary. I've not, India, I get a lot of kids from India. And it works fine there. Yeah. Wow. Yep. It works fine. So Very. A question. Huge. One question I have is, um, with with entrepreneurship in general, um, what resources have you used, or would you recommend someone to use when they're first starting out? In terms of, was there any like free tools or anything that you've seen? Wow, this really helps a lot of people. Um, whether it's like with design software or whatever. What What do those things look like? Do you have any that you would recommend? Yeah. Um, uh, a course was helpful because usually what they'll do is make recommendations for you and it doesn't necessarily have to be my course but most of them are going to be adult courses and if they're courses for kids they look like junior achievement or young entrepreneurs of America they're heavy they're by application process you know so it's kind of hard to find entrepreneurship classes that are geared to kids I would say you need to make use of first and foremost what's called a tech stack and so those that's the technology you need to be able to be successful so for example um, free marketing material now I say this in my class like Canva would be a good example where you can make social media and posters and stuff like that but because I work with children as young as six you don't want to undervalue a hand-drawn poster <laughs> there is marketing mm -hmm. appeal and, and people don't want to admit that but I say it in my course you got a kid factor going on here and you don't want to miss that opportunity. It's so true, right? If a child, if I were selling energy gummies at the side of the road, no one would stop. I mean, I'd have to have some pretty <laughs> professional looking marketing. And honestly, I'd probably hire a child to sell it. So <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Uh, there is, and then I had, okay, so that's the example I'm using because there was a young girl that did that. They actually made energy gummies. And we go through this whole exercise of defining your uh, customer avatar, your ideal customer. And it was um, sports, like kids in sports. And then she narrowed it down even further because she played hockey to hockey players. So she really, when you create your customer avatar, so that would be the next tool, by the way, that I would suggest is that people need to know who their customer is. Very succinctly they need to know who that customer is so then she went and sat outside of an arena because she couldn't sell in the arena legally she opened her mom's hatchback put up a sandwich board and sold it out of the back of the car and sold out because it was a tournament that weekend and they kept coming in and out and in and out of the arena right so there's i i would say the free marketing like get into learning a little bit about um because when you get into a tool like canva you know what the dimensions are. If you're going to take your advertising online, you'll see what an Instagram post dimension should be. You'll see what a Facebook post dimension would be. What are the dimensions of a poster? Why is that interesting? Because then the next tool I would recommend is find a really good printing company like Vistaprints. Hmm. So you wanna go find somebody that does nice bulk printing that's, and you can make business cards with those people. And I think I have a business card. I think it cost me, seven dollars for example i know becca you can't see this but there's a box of credit that's like seven bucks and then you design it online right yeah mm -hmm. and then it takes 
I just did that. Like I don't have a, I don't have a background in graphic design or marketing. So a good, a good printing company would be very helpful. The next thing you need to do is um, you have to be a master online researcher. <laughs> so that would be the next suggestion I would have. You need to know who the competitors are and it's not really competitors. So that's, I teach that to say, if somebody is already selling your product, it's a proven product in the marketplace. You don't have to freak out and say, oh my God, but somebody else had my idea. That's actually a good thing, right? I mean, how many coffee shops do you see on one street? Because it's proven that people go to that street in order to buy coffee. So another coffee shop will pop up. So that's competition is a good thing, but it'll help you define your price, right? Where's your price point? So an online researcher to see how other people are doing it. It's like Picasso said, good artists copy, but great artists steal. So you need to go out and see how <laughs> other people are doing it. I mean, that legitimately, children have a very difficult time with the cheating. Mm. And I want to communicate that if somebody else is doing well, you are what you bring. You're the unique factor. You're the differentiating factor in your business. So even if you model it, I mean, as an adult, the online courses I have taken to build my business is the whole course, those ones that are successful that I follow, they all come online and go, I want you to do exactly what I do. Because I did all these steps and I did it this way and I make a lot of money now. <laughs> so I want you to do exactly what I do and you will make a lot of money. So that's in course creation, uh, in marketing, in launching, in self-publishing, in selling a physical product. There's all these gurus out there that go, look how much money I made. So do it like me. So that would be my last suggestion mm -hmm. is go out and find somebody else doing what you're doing well and copy what they're doing. Yeah. Well, and I can, I can definitely see how that is something like you learned very quickly in a startup, especially for something online. Because I mean, if you look at how like major companies have changed so many things like Amazon, for example, when yeah. they started with their user experience of their shopping cart, um, knowing that kind of stuff, everyone else was like, look at Amazon, look what they're doing. I want to do exactly. this too. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's like you look at who the best of the best is and then you imitate them on a smaller scale if you can with the resources that you have. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah that's, that's absolutely right. Yeah. So as we kind of come to a close here, um, I'm just thinking about uh, what people can be doing during this time of isolation. And it sounds like taking your class would be an incredible opportunity to kind of just optimize the time that we have at home. Um, so I definitely think that that would be good for people to utilize during this time. Um, but as we move into the sister gawk portion of um, our episode, uh, we would love it if you would tell us a story. Um, so I know that you have something that you wanted to share, so I'll let you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I was a previous conversation with Rebecca about, uh, I live in Canada, as you all heard, and <laughs> An interesting piece of trivia about the province that I live in. So I'm right above Montana, just so that you understand kind of physically where I am. Um, Montana, Idaho, kind of right, about, right around there. Um, and we are, the province of Alberta is the largest rat-free land mass in the world. And everybody can laugh now. My husband rat, is from... Rat-free. <laughs> rat-free. I know. My husband's from the neighboring province that has, uh, which is Saskatchewan. We all love the name Saskatchewan and province. <laughs> Trust me, Canadians make fun of that name too, so don't worry about it. Um, and they've got tons of rats. Uh, and so he thinks this is hilarious. He goes... <laughs> Like, what do they do? Do they like roam around, like killing them? And I said, yes. And actually they look like Ghostbusters. Literally, they have like this weird hearse vehicle. And when what? they dressed all in white, I'm not kidding. You know, because it's not that there haven't been rats here, but when we find nests, usually in a dump, right? That's where you'd find infestations. They will come in and they eliminate them. You know, like, how do you do this with rail? You know, like them coming in in grain cars and all that kind of stuff. Rat free means we're below a certain population. Okay. So it's not like there's zero rats, but they're so good at it that I'd never seen a rat in my life. Right. <laughs> oh. So I, I know I never, I'm telling you we're a rat free landmass. So that I was actually working on a software project in my husband's province. That's how I met him. And it's right next door. And 
I was hanging out at his house and I, you know, we're, we're working there and the, he had a dog and a cat and the cat had killed a rat and left it on the front lawn. And it's the first time I'd ever seen a rat. And I swear, I thought it was a small dog. I thought the cat actually killed a small dog. <laughs> that stupid rat was so big. I gagged. Like, I'm actually frightened of rats. I think that's actually what has happened in Alberta, is that because we're a rat-free landmass and kids here don't see rats, I am completely weirded out by them. Like, I have no problem with bugs. Like, cockroaches. No, we don't have cockroaches either because we're too cold up here. But they don't even bother me. I'm not even bothered by bugs. But rats, it's, you know, in my mind, it's the end of days when you see rats. Like, it's, <laughs> like, it's terrible. <laughs> So I freaked out. I'm screaming. I wouldn't touch it. He thought I had gone insane. And then that's how the topic of, well, did you know that Alberta is the largest rat-free land in the world? And it, it has it has been a talk of, topic of constant jokes and jabs because he lives here in Alberta with me now. And he has to admit that he's never seen a rat here. And I'm like, ha ha. You know, I've seen lots since. I lived in China. They would run across my face in the middle of the night. Oh, I've been to oh New York. God. Yeah, gross. Yeah, okay, but you know, now it's like, whatever, that's the least of your concerns in China. <laughs> yeah. So that's, you know, or I've been in New York where they've run underneath the, in the subway, they run underneath the bench. Mm -hmm. And yes, I will admit I screamed and leapt up in a crowded subway full of people. And I screamed and jumped onto the bench. It was not my most proudest. And yeah, it's uh People laughed at me, I have to admit. Yeah, people thought I was nuts. You're not from here, are you? What was your first clue? <laughs> so, so yeah. yes, we don't have it any rats like a good, uh, It sounds like a good business opportunity um, for <laughs> any kind of <laughs> company that's doing that with the hearse, being like, you want us to come eradicate your town? Yeah, yeah eradicate. Rat that would be the first thing. Yeah, right. Eradicate. <laughs> eradicate yeah we're we're uh we're a little bit more socialist than you guys are so the government takes care of stuff like that so okay. it's our provincial government that does that you know yes i mean maybe there's a business opportunity there but i don't know if the government would give it up that the last one uh, which is an interesting story is they actually brought snakes in so they actually when they had it there was a small town that ended up with an infestation in the dump and they brought in bull snakes hmm. so they that's how they got rid of it. So I thought it was very clever. They're not What's up them. with Saskatchewan? Like, they just haven't gotten on the same page to just, Nobody like... has. I don't know. <laughs> it's probably more the reverse question of why is this such an obsessive need for Alberta? You know? Because we can actually, like, you know, talk about COVID-19. Okay, so rats are dirty, right? Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, that's a cause for concern. Mm -hmm. But I was just watching a, a really great video by, um, what's it called? The medical ninja or science nerd ninja or some guy and he did this great whiteboard explanation of SARS, MERS and COVID-19 which are all coronaviruses and mm -hmm. how how they how they mutate, how they spread, where they come from and every single one of those viruses, those coronaviruses started at a bat mm -hmm. and then mutated the coronavirus so that three different animals, a civet, a camel and I can't remember the name of the one COVID came from. It's like an anteater. It's a type of anteater. Mm. And then it mutated again in order to be spread to humans because it's a zoonotic uh, disease, right? So mm. I don't know why rats are such an obsession for Alberta because we definitely have bats. You would think now that would be something <laughs> nobody would suggest eradicating bats. Like that would be, oh my gosh. I mean, they're so important for the ecosystem and eating yeah, maybe it's just, I don't know why. What is it with Alberta and their obsession with getting rid of rats? I haven't, you know, I've never bothered to research it, but I'm super proud to tell people that Alberta is the largest rat-free landmass in the world. <laughs> Most Albertans are. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Some bumper stickers. Yeah. Oh, that's a great, it. there's a business idea. There you right? go. <laughs> well, I don't know. If any kid is listening to this right now that lives in Alberta, there you go. There's an opportunity, you know, get in one of those printing companies. And uh, actually just do drop shipping, right? Print on demand. Yeah. Alberta's the largest rat free limit. Why do you have rats when Alberta doesn't? Yeah, there be so many things. <laughs> you yeah. can make so many slogans. <laughs> I know. I know. 
Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Stacy. Um, we appreciate hearing all your stories and stuff. And um, yeah, we wish you all the best of luck and then health and safety in this time. Yeah, no kidding. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah.